that on Q2, a free fare? That gate charge is a big barrier to people in lower income, elderly, disabled people, uh, as well as just people with big families. Montana Fair can cost families as much as $100, but one Billings man and former fair consultant says it doesn't have to be that way. I'll dive into the fees. Plus, a Glacier High student from Kalispell fighting for his life while another remains in the hospital after being struck by lightning on the soccer practice field. We'll have the details. And night two at the DNC, headlined by former President Barack Obama. Here in Illinois, uh, we know a thing or two about electing president. The MTN 430 News starts right now. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this Tuesday. I'm Andrea Lutz. Tonight, a look at Montana Fair's biggest year yet. However, we're hearing how one former fair consultant says it could be even bigger if admission was free. Montana Fair executives say they need that gate admission to make future improvements at Metro Park. However, I spoke to one man who thinks that could still happen while also saving taxpayer dollars on the heels of the biggest year yet. Setting records every day. It does seem like a good time to at least look into something like free admission. A former fair consultant says things could be a lot bigger. That gate charge is a big barrier to people in lower income, elderly, disabled people, uh, as well as just people with big families. Tom Aldridge worked for the Western people Montana Fair in Missoula. Free admission started at that fair in 2017, and it was a big time of changes, just like the Metro's going through now. At that time, he pushed commissioners to open the gates to fair goers for free, running an analysis to see how it could impact costs. People would keep coming back for more, and when you get through that barrier where you don't have to pay to get through the gate, you feel like you're getting a better deal and you're probably going to spend more money on all the attractions. After that test run season, commissioners voted to keep it permanent. It, pretty much every metric went through the roof. Because that year it paid off. Attendance went up by 24%, concessions saw an increase of 16%, and sales for tickets sold at the carnival went up 19%. We simplified operations, so we were able to you know, lower our expenses while having a slightly lower revenue, but it costs the taxpayers about 30,000 less dollars that year. Aldridge says doing away with admission at the gate meant doing away with staffing at the gate, which also took operating costs away. We actually arrived at free admission through the process of eliminating expenses. And that was one of the biggest ones. The cost of entry on a normal day at Montana Fair is about 12 bucks. Those with the fair estimate it will generate 30% of its annual revenue for the venue. And I know that overall for the whole week, we're going to set another record as well. Which they say is good. Why change it? Aldridge says, why not? The public's money is in their hands and it, it is a risk. You have to acknowledge it's a risk. There's a good chance that the free admission surge in attendance is going to make you more money. Those with Montana Fair tell me they didn't want to specifically address free admission for this story just yet, but they did say they're currently compiling and finalizing all the numbers for the 2024 fair. They expect to release those next week, and then they'll discuss the vision and future of Montana Fair. Now to the very latest on a Glacier High soccer player still in the ICU after being struck by lightning during practice. The strike also injured a second player and an assistant coach who remain in the hospital tonight. School officials say that lightning strike occurred on the soccer field on Monday night. All three were transported and one player taken immediately to ICU. He and another player and the coach are all uh, remain in the hospital tonight. The head coach deployed an AED while then following the school's lightning protocol, keeping the team off the field for 30 minutes after the last lightning strike passed. The athletic director says the random strike occurred after a storm passed over Kalispell. A group of concerned Butte residents are furious after spotting masked men with white supremacy signs hanging out on an interstate overpass. MTN's Megan Thompson hears from one of them who plans to do something about the racist displays. 
Well, the interstate system that passes through Butte connects the country from the east coast to the west coast to the north and the south. But this past weekend, this bridge right here behind me carried a message of hate when three masked men decided to show up with white supremacist propaganda. Now people in the community are speaking out and they say this kind of messaging cannot be tolerated and that Butte is for everybody. It's very disheartening to see someone take these kind of actions and I think that we need to stand up with one loud voice and say not in our town. We don't want that here. We want to be a town that welcomes everyone. Josh Peck is a member of a local group that monitors the individuals posting hate signage. He says the individuals simply don't understand Butte's history as a melting pot. For 150 years we've been a melting pot and we've welcomed people from all over the world to come here and work on our mines. There were no smoking signs that hung at the Butte mines that had 67 languages on them. This is not the first time masked individuals have posted up with racist slogans around town. Others in the group Josh belongs to have been taking down signage plastered in public places for several years. Unfortunately, we're at a point where just ignoring them isn't the solution. We need to be able to say in one voice that we don't want that here. That's not what we're about. And that's why Josh and others in his group are planning a rally for August 24th from 10 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon at Father Sheehan Park. We just want to get together and share our overall feelings on, on welcoming people to our community, on being proud of our community the way it is. And we don't need to change that and we don't need to add any unwelcome nuisances. In Butte, Megan Thompson, MTN News. More severe weather on this Tuesday just issued a handful of minutes ago. A severe thunderstorm warning for most of northern Park County and western parts of Sweetgrass County because of this thunderstorm exiting Gallatin County. The storm itself is moving 50 miles an hour. It's already generated 60 mile an hour wind gusts at Bozeman Pass, gusts up to 70 miles an hour possible. It is moving toward the east northeast at about 50 miles an hour, so take shelter. More details in your forecast coming up. It's day two of the Democratic National Convention, and today's theme is A Bold Vision for America's Future. Former President Barack Obama and Michelle Obama are both scheduled to speak. Skylar Henry is in Chicago with the latest. You know, here in Illinois, uh, we know a thing or two about electing presidents. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker looked to fire up delegates out of his speech this evening at the Democratic National Convention. If we fight hard enough, in 77 days, we're going to send Kamala Harris and Tim Walsh to the White House. Last night, saw President Biden pass the torch to Vice President Kamala Harris. I felt that Joe Biden had given 52 years of great service to his country, and passing the baton on was very emotional and energizing for us. Tonight, former President Barack Obama and former First Lady Michelle Obama are both scheduled to take the stage. I'm looking forward to Michelle Obama. She's our idol, my idol. As well as former Trump White House Press Secretary Stephanie Grisham, joining other Republicans speaking this week. We're reaching across the aisle. Already, we are seeing Donald Trump lose support from his own party, including those who know him the best. While the party gathers in Chicago, Vice President Harris and Governor Tim Walz are scheduled to campaign in Milwaukee. We caught up with a couple of young delegates from Wisconsin. I'm surprised you guys aren't hanging out with the folks in Milwaukee today. Y'all are... I know. Don't get me started on that. I was so sad because I really wanted to go. There will also be a ceremonial roll call of states to make Harris the party's nominee. Democrats formally nominated her in a virtual roll call earlier this month. Skyler Henry, CBS News, Chicago. This DNC is unlike any other after President Biden decided not to pursue a second term. This week is a sort of passing of the torch as he now throws his total support behind Vice President Kamala Harris. Tonight, Serena Marshall looks at the legacy of President Joe Biden. When Joe Biden was sworn in as president. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. do solemnly swear. The world was in the midst of a global pandemic. Weeks prior, those same sacred steps scarred by political unrest the kind that had led him to run in the first place. The core values of this nation are standing in the world, our very democracy. Everything that has made America, America is at stake. Now that he is no longer seeking a second term. I revere this office, but I love my country more. The battle for the soul of America that brought him into the race 
may be the one issue that will also define the legacy he'll leave behind. Ending more than 50 years of service in the Senate, two failed presidential bids and the vice presidency. Now, as the oldest sitting president, his record is seen by those around him as one of keeping promises. From appointing the first black woman to the Supreme Court, to welcoming home more than 70 hostages from around the world. And now, their brutal ordeal is over and they're free. And bringing two new nations into NATO. Finland and Sweden have joined the alliance. Aside from NATO, his foreign policy record is mixed. The chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan and unable so far to stop the carnage in Gaza. On the domestic front, his legacy on firmer ground. He secured the sweeping bipartisan American rescue plan, considered his crowning legislative achievement, which pumped money into a COVID ravaged economy. An economy that has since seen a steady unemployment rate and a robust stock market. But that's a message that hasn't resonated with Americans, likely due to inflation, which may be what defined him even more. But what will likely cement his place in the history books? The choice he didn't want to make. There is a sense that presidents are successful when they are selfless. And Joe Biden's dropping out of the presidency to aid his party. And so I think that he'll get a fairly robust amount of support on greatness measures as a result of that. According to those around him, he knew he no longer was the right messenger for the time, defining his legacy by upending his own hopes. But in the defense of democracy, which is a stake, I think is more important than any title. Now his legacy defined perhaps less by his walking away and instead by who walks in to the Oval Office come January. Serena Marshall, Scripps News, Chicago. Governor Greg Gianforte says he's purchased 50,000 acres of habitat conservation leases in partnership with the Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. He says this will increase public access, keep agriculture land in production and conserve prairie habitats. The 50,000 acres make up eight private land owners voluntarily retaining wildlife habitat for about 30 years. Six of the properties are funded by Habitat Montana and the rest split between Habitat Montana and FWP's bird wetland program. Montana's Senate President Jason Ellsworth says a legislative committee is preparing to issue subpoenas to elected officials. They claim they're not receiving information needed for their reports. MTN's Jonathan Anbarian looks into the issue. Senate President Jason Ellsworth says that an existing select committee investigating the state's judiciary and a newly created one looking into an election issue in Butte need to finish their work in a timely manner and that new policies will help them do that. It's the citizens' money. We don't need to be spending more of their money being here. So we need to run efficiently. And what this will allow us to do is continue to run efficiently. On Tuesday, the Senate Select Committee on Judicial Oversight and Reform adopted two proposals from Ellsworth. One says the committee will issue subpoenas to elected officials and those working under them when asking them to testify. The other says those testifying will be asked to sign a document saying they'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as in a courtroom. Ellsworth also announced this weekend that he was convening a select committee to investigate what led to this week's recount in Butte, Silverbow County, where the clerk says about one 1,000 votes may have been counted twice. He said he expects that committee may follow this one in adopting these policies. You know, we need complete answers from people, and I think this will help facilitate us to get there. It, it's certainly not meant to be adversarial. Ellsworth created the Judiciary Select Committee after a series of court rulings that Republican legislative leaders said overstepped their authority. Democrats have been refusing to participate, saying it was a political stunt and part of a pattern of attacks on the judicial branch. Democratic leaders did appoint two Butte lawmakers to serve on the election committee. Senate Minority Leader Pat Flowers told MTN he thought these proposed policies were unnecessary. Ellsworth declined to give specific timelines on when these committees might come out with their reports. He said that will happen when their work gets done. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. Still to come on the MTN 430 News on Q2, racing against the clock. An eastern Montana barrel racer has fought through multiple health challenges. And now she is back competing all thanks to a life-saving device. We have that story, but first it could be a bumpy few days for the weather. Jason has that complete seven day forecast right after this.